Welcome everyone. Today we are here for a very special exploring tour with the Nasher Sculpture Center. I am Zoe Frost with Celebration Magazine and we had 137 people registered for today's presentation. Now before we begin, I did want to thank Blue Cross Blue Shield and Karen Trevet for being a sponsor of today's event. If you have any questions about your Medicare insurance or want to explore your options with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas, please do reach out to to them. Now today, uh, we are joined by Dr. Becky Daniels. She is retired after 42 years of classroom teaching in Texas and Germany and earned her PhD in aesthetics from the University of Texas at Dallas in 2016. Her dissertation focused on museum education, which led her to her current position as a gallery educator at the Nasher Sculpture Center in downtown Dallas, Texas. In her free time, she enjoys camping in her RV. So today, we're going to be talking about the Nasher Prize, which is an award dedicated exclusively to excellence in contemporary sculpture. It is given annually to a living sculptor whose work has had an extraordinary impact on the art form. Today, we're going to explore the art and life of the 2020 Nasher Prize Laureate, Michael Rakowitz. He offers a deeply considered version of sculpture's possibilities in the face of political and humanitarian crisis. You just might leave here inspired to think about sculpture in a completely different way. Becky, take it away pause and move back into our presentation. And let's talk about Rakowitz's family a little bit. This is another example of creating an art and no one mentioned this, but I bet many of you do that, do this, and that's cooking, the art of cooking. And some of the recipes that I do are from my grandmother, and I like to imagine that they learned that from their parents or grandparents. Uh, it's also really wonderful to learn how to cook over pandemic. My neighbor uh, has been teaching me how to cook Indian food and use all kinds of wonderful spices that I've never mm. used before. So um, cooking is an art uh, and a skill. So this is uh, in New York City. And it is Rakowitz's family business. And it was started when his family immigrated to New York in 1946. And it is an import store for Iraqi food products, especially dates and date syrup. Now, I've eaten dates before. I imagine many of you have had a date before, but I had never heard of date syrup before I met Michael Rakowitz. And so date syrup is a very common ingredient in Iraqi food. And it is actually a common ingredient in food all over the Middle East. So let me explain the connection between Rakowitz and food and politics and heritage. So Rakowitz had first become aware of the connection between food and politics when during the first Gulf War, he was 16 years old. And I know we all remember sitting at home and watching CNN footage of night vision. It was green of missiles being fired and exploding in Iraq. And uh, Rakowitz grew up in a home that he knew where his family was from Iraq, but he was in the most awful situation where the country he fled two was at war with the country he had come from. And his mother was determined that his knowledge of Iraq would not be tarnished with pictures of war. So his grandmother and mother started teaching him how to cook amazing Iraqi cuisine. So a dozen years later, Rakowitz was in New York and the second Gulf War was underway. And Rakowitz decided that he wanted to create a positive view of Iraq culture with food. And so he started up a series of cooking classes, teaching his mom's Iraqi recipes to different groups around the city. 
combining people from very different backgrounds that had a connection with Iraq. Now listen to the people he assembled. He brought in Iraqi refugees, veterans from the Iraq war, and the children and spouses of military that were fighting in the Middle East. So interesting because those people wouldn't necessarily have had contact with each other. So by cooking together and sharing meals together, people began to know each other. And eventually he opened up a food truck that was called the Iraqi kitchen, the enemy kitchen. And you can see it uh, here in this uh, picture. And while the enemy kitchen and its food efforts didn't stop the war, it did create some understanding and cross-cultural communication. It offset some of the hostility from the war with the Iraqi tradition of hospitality and really good food. So as part of the Nasher Prize, the last thing I got to do before um, we all got shut down with the pandemic in February of 2020, Rakowitz came to Dallas as part of his Nasher Prize and he worked with local farmers that assist uh, military veterans that are returning and help them make the transition. And he also worked with uh, Iraqi refugees and other Middle Eastern refugees with Brick Bread Borders. And that's a catering company that empowers refugee women as cooks and helps them get their businesses started. And they made a fabulous picnic and served it uh, as a gift to the people of the city and it was an amazing experience. And out of this came a book called A House with a Date Palm Will Never Starve. And this book is a book of 41 recipes from 41 different chefs all over the world that are cooking with date syrup. And it's for sale in the Nasher gift shop. And it's just a really fun way to try something really different. So here's my next question. What is an artifact in your home that holds cultural significance for your family? Now, it might be a tangible object, something that you can touch and see. For example, this, somebody said tatting. My uh, German grandma tatted this hat for my father's christening when he was born. And it's a very precious thing. It's very fragile and yellow with age, but I love it dearly. So is there something in your house, old or new, something that's tangible that you can touch and see that holds special meaning? Or is there something intangible, a song, a story that you tell when you get together as a family, a ritual that you and some loved ones have done together? So museums can collect tangible objects that you can see, but museums also can collect intangible objects, cultural ideas and songs and stories. So if there is one object that you can limit yourself to think about, what I'm curious is, what's the object, intangible or tangible? And then do you know anything about how it was made and have you been able to pass the story on to the next generation to keep it going? So let's get that chat chatting. Is there some artifact with cultural significance that is in your family? And it uh, might be something that you can see and touch. It might be something that just exists in your mind, a song or a story or a ritual. And then if you know anything about where it originated, how the thing was created or where it came from, and have you been able to pass the stories on to the next generation? So those are the questions. Do we have any chats coming through yet? We sure do. So Joyce Lane says she has a Mayan calendar, um, Tina Pennington, a Bible. Um, Sharon said Jade from Alaska. Um, Vivian and Dennis, you just made my heart skip a beat. So Dennis's dad was a Pittsburgh symphony violinist back in the 20s and 30s. And they still have one of his violins. Oh my, I used to play. So, I had oh my gosh, that's amazing, right? Oh, I love that. Um, 
Lori Goldstein says she has a ring that is made out of a gun shell casing that has a heart with a piece of broken glass. Her father had this made when he fought in the Korean War. Wow. Um, Tina does have a question. Um, related and unrelated is date syrup sweet or bitter it's sweet okay there we go there's your answer i was wondering um all right um okay maria i'm gonna try not to butcher this when i say it she says she has a, a tangible item uh boleadoras used by the gauchos of argentina and it is made with stone and leather mm -hmm. Um, grandfather's Jewish prayer book from World War One. Oh, wow. Oh, neat. Um, Phyllis Craby says she has a handmade rocking chair made by her great grandfather wow. um, that she used to rock with her babies. And hopefully, it will be used for her grandchildren. How cool. So oh, wow. Cool. Um, Let's see. Kim says she has her parents' living room set from the 50s, and it reminds her of growing up. Man, Kim, people want that stuff again. So It is back in style. <laughs> That's right. Um, an antique vase from some from Lili Lee's trip to China in 1981. Um, a framed letter written by Elaine says she has a framed letter written by her grandmother to her three sons, on her golden wedding anniversary. Guys, you've got neat families. Um, uh, Sandy has some doilies that her grandmother made and she's um, since shown her daughter how to crochet. Uh, her granddaughter, I'm sorry, how to crochet. Um, Linda says she has an original blueprint of, a shot, of the shotgun house from New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, mm -hmm. Karen Shaw has crochet work from a grandparent. Oh, neat. Jan held on to a glass gun that her father brought from Mississippi when he was six that had candy in it. Um, <laughs> Dad's senior high school picture, a wooden hutch that my parents had for many years that they remember as a child. Um, a child-sized rocking chair made by her grandfather and a doll bed made by uh, her dad from Farron. Um, and then Vivian crocheted sheets, pillow vases, and tea towels that Vivian's grandmother made. Um, a china, grandmother's china hutch, uh, grandmother's rings. I have a sculpture from Germany that my late brother-in-law brought back from World War II when he was there. That's from Jan Reynolds. Um, a, oh, interesting. Jan Bertrand has a sculpture crucifix from her mother's funeral. She was 18 years old when she died 61 years ago. So it's a 61 year old uh, sculptural crucifix. Um, Suzanne Elliott has research that her uncle did on family ancestry, jewelry of her mother's um, and her father's World War II medals. Um, oh, wow. Um, Donna and Al Stroud said they had a glass-headed doll that had a cloth body that belonged to her mother, and it also has glass hands and feet. Um oh a cameo brooch and ring, um, a silver dollar from 1882 that's from a grandfather. Oh, neat. Lori Goldstein also has a shofar. Is that, did I say that right? Uh, which is a ram's horn given to her father as a gift. Wow. 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 There, you guys got to bring that all to our next show and tell. I want to see it all. <laughs> Well, it's really fun to create, especially if you have grandchildren around, to go to a museum and talk about what a museum is and what a museum does. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to do a lesson on that too. It's a lot of fun. And then take the kids and set up the museum of 
the Becker family is what we did. And then the kids were tour guides and they could give a tour. And in doing this, they were learning some leadership skills, but they were also learning the history of some of the family objects that someday they would inherit. Oh, and yeah. it was really a fun thing to do. It, it was uh, having a, a museum of home was really kind of a neat thing. So you can think about doing that as well. Very neat. All right, one more. Can we do one more? Yeah. All right. So we're going to look at one more way that Rakowitz creates loss, a hope and community after loss. And this is something that I remember on the news, and I bet that you do too. So in 2007, we saw videos in Iraq of the National Museum in Baghdad in 2003 is when it started being destroyed. There were mm. people knocking over the sculptures and hammering them into bits and totally destroying them. And it was very tragic. So that was in 2003. And in 2007, Michael Rakowitz started a project called The Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist. And this project is still going until today. And for this work of art, this series of works of art, Rakowitz is not recreating artworks. You know him well enough now to know that's not something he would do. But he's creating placeholders, or he calls them ghosts, of 15,000 of the artifacts that were lost or stolen. He makes them out of materials that reference objects embedded in the Iraqis' daily lives, including date syrup cans, Iraqi food packaging, and Arabic newspaper. So on your left here, you see a Lamasu, which is an ancient mythical creature that guarded the gates at the palace in Nineveh, Iraq. On the right, you can see Rakowitz's sculpture, made out of date syrup cans. So he in, the date syrup cans were empty and he created it and it is on the fourth plinth at Trafalgar Square in London. So if any of you have been to London, you recognize some of these buildings, you know how huge this Lama Sioux is. 15,000 objects he is attempting to recreate. Wow. Not recreate, the exact replica, but create a ghost or a placeholder of. And so he's going to continue this throughout his lifetime. But right now, you can come see some of those objects at the Nasher. So let me show you what we have right now that you can see. So on the left, um, you can see a Lama Sioux that was not destroyed. This um, was, is, uh, is one that is in a museum. And on the right, you can see a picture of a Lama Sioux actually guarding the gates to the ancient city of Nimrud before it was destroyed. Now, the destruction of artifacts was not just done by terrorists and looters. It was also done by archaeologists many, many years ago before people understood the meaning of cultural heritage. So let me give you a little history. In case you can't tell, I'm a retired history teacher, so I love history. So present-day Iraq used to be called Assyria, and the Assyrian city of Nimrud started in 1350 BCE. 1350 BCE. Now, by 800 BC, Nimrud had grown to 75,000 inhabitants, making it the largest city in the world at the time. This is even larger than the cities of Egypt. Someone said they had been to Egypt. So this is even larger than Alexandria or the other cities in Egypt at that time. Now, around 800 BCE, the Assyrian king con constructed this very palace you see on the right, in Nimrud. It's about 20 kilometers south of Mosul, Iraq. And Mosul, unfortunately, we know mostly from war. It covered 12 acres of land. 
and had more than 200 rooms in the palace. That's massive by today's standards. Now, to put this in context, this happened, this palace was built five centuries, 500 years before Alexander the Great ruled ancient Macedonia and Greece in 300 BCE. So this is well before the Romans. Here you can see the original mythical creature. At one time it was painted beautiful bright colors, but they have faded over the years. Now, in 2015, the terrorist organization ISIL announced its intention to totally destroy the site because it was un-Islamic and Assyrian, which was an evil culture, according to the terrorist. So in March 2015, the Iraqi government reported that ISIL had used bulldozers to totally destroy any archaeological remains of the city. The videos were released showing the destruction in progress. And in November 2016, the first Iraqi forces were able to retake the site and they confirmed that 90% of the evac uh, excavated city had been terribly, completely, totally destroyed. So I'm going to show you now a video of the gallery at the Nasher where these works are. It's a very short video. And I saw, oh, there we go. Let me see if I can get this to go. Nope. Or try. There we go. Now, as you look around the, the gallery in the Nasher in Dallas, you'll notice there's some pieces missing from the room. This is a reconstruction of the ancient palace room, the throne room in Nimrud. And Rakowitz has made a ghost or a replica of the panels that has, history has documented. But the, some of these were destroyed and never documented, either destroyed by archeologists to break and move to other museums, or to actually destroy it completely where we have no idea. So let me tell you how he makes these exquisite, exquisite works of art. He starts with photographs of anything that still exists or has existed that was photographed. And after studying the photographs, they create a digital computerized drawing, enlarge that and transfer that image onto cardboard. Then with a team of students and sculptors, he recreates the panel in exact detail in the same proportions that they were originally in the palace. Then the artist painstakingly cut out little pieces of um, food wrappers and sardine cans and tea bags, any kind of beautiful color with Iraqi writing or culture is a part of it and collage them to give color to the cardboard. And they're using actually the Iraqi culture, their newspapers, their food to color and bring life to the ghost. Now in this picture, you can see them in progress and you notice these big cracks running across them horizontally. Well, the dark brown cracks are made out of Iraqi newspaper and they show places where the original sculpture were, was, were damaged many, many years ago. So some of the cracks are damages caused by archeologists when they were trying to move chunks of this out to bring to Western museums. Pieces were sent to 76 museums around the world, 36 in the United States, and 13 in the United Kingdom make up part of that 76. The museums legally acquired all the work of art, but today the practice is limited under the respect and ethics of the International Council of Museums. And this is an entire different uh, lesson that I'd love to teach about the ethics of archeology span and cultural patronage and who really owns what 
It's an amazing story. Some of these were damaged by storms or earthquakes or things that happened before history recorded it. Now take a minute and look at this gorgeous picture and just see what you notice. This is one of the ones in the Nasher. Um, he is not wearing an Apple watch. That's something a lot of the students want to know. They did not have Apple watches in 800 BCE. Um, but uh, this is the Lamasu, this mythical creature. It's part human, part eagle, and it has four spectacular wings. And from this angle, you can see three of them. And uh, one of uh, our, my colleagues at the Nasher is from Iran and she could read the cans and she let me know that the blue stripes that run along the border of his sleeve and up over the top of his shoulder are from sardine cans. Mm. And that the pink is from uh, rose hip and strawberry tea. So um, what's happening here is uh, archeologists guess what's happening is that he's gardening and that in his hand, the thing that looks like an avocado is actually a stone. And he has this delightful little purse in his hand and the purse is holding pollen. And he's reaching in there and getting the pollen on the stone. And then he's pollinating the plant so that they can have more fruit, which is really amazing. Now our gallery is a similar size and shape to one room, the throne room in the palace of Nimrud. And so what the Nasher has done with Rakowitz is to recreate the room and actually show you the panels that still exist in photographs or in museums today. And the panels that we don't know where they are are marked on the floor below the empty spaces. And when you go, you can walk around the room and a history of every panel is included, even the missing panels. If they know which museum it's in, they'll tell you on the panel. And the panels also include quotations from people that in some way are connected to the tragedy. Um, Iraqi residents, uh, museum scholars, different people who have studied it. The quotes are really powerful. Now the quotes are written on the floor and I don't know about you, but I can't exactly bend over and get down on the floor to read them. So the Nasher's got your back. Um, we have a large type that you can get at the front desk so that you can read it yourself and hold it in your hands. And we also have uh, floor, floor panels in the room that you will be able to see when you're there. So uh, don't worry if you can't bend over and read them on the floor. But I just want to close today with a couple of quotations that I thought were particularly meaningful. It is hard to say what's missing because no one even knows what's in the piles of rubble to know if anything's been stolen. And a final quote, this is yet another attack against the Iraqi people. It reminds us that nothing is safe from the cultural cleansing underway in the country. It targets human lives, minorities, and is marked by the systemic destruction of humanity's ancient heritage. So I want to ask you to think back on these ways that Rakowitz took some tragic loss and has recreated a feeling of beauty and hope and even community. If you would like to know more and listen to him speak, he is speaking on Friday, April 16th at noon. It's free, it's a virtual, so you don't have to be there. You can do it on your computer. And he's going to give a lecture that he talks about all of some of the things I've shown you. And uh, he's going to explore the question that is really powerful during this pandemic. If I can't be there with you, how can I show you where I am? So I wanna end with one last question today. During the pandemic, we've all suffered loss and our traditional ways of mourning no longer really exist anymore. And our, we want, I want you to just reflect back on what you have lost during the pandemic. Many of us have lost loved ones all of us have lost some of our freedom, some of our beloved activities, some joy. 
On top of this, it sounds like some of you have suffered loss of your home after the storm and pipes burst. So as you cautiously, and we all cautiously reemerge, what do you want to do first? And what are some things that are just daily activities that you will appreciate more than you've ever appreciated before? So I'm gonna close with those. And if you would like to put a couple of things in the chat, you're welcome to do that. What things are you really wanting to do first? And what activities are you most going to appreciate as we start to get back to normal life? Okay, so um, first I do have a question. Never heard of BCE. What's the difference between BCE and BC? BC is uh, before Christ. BCE signifies the same year since the Christian calendar is dominant in world culture. Mm. But BCE is more um, intercultural. So uh, before the Christian era, BCE, as opposed to BC, which is before Christ. So in history courses today, in order, I taught in a school for 35 years that had a very a strong Jewish population. And so we were very careful not to say BC, we would say BCE. Interesting. And it, it's, a, it's a 21st century uh, inclusive term. Thank you for asking that. Hey, Travel. That's, a, oh. that's a great question. Roy, I got to give credit. Roy Bales is the one that asked that question. So that's a great question. Yeah. Um, so Lori Foster said she wants to attend live music concerts. Um, oh, yes. I am right there with you on that one. Why that? This is exactly what came to mind for me. Hugs. I miss hugging my friends and seeing my friends. Um, Let's see, singing in the choir and directing a handbell choir. Yes. Um, going back to volunteering at her local public library as well as just being able to browse around the library. And that's from Lori Goldstein. Yes. Um, Suzanne Elliott asked a question. So um, the images that you showed, um, were those idols that people worshiped? Um, no, they were, uh, the llamas through the winged, winged creatures were mm -hmm. protecting. They were mythical creatures that were supposed to protect the gates and protect the city. Oh, interesting. Okay. Very neat. Um, so Vivian and Dennis, they're looking forward to traveling with us here at Celebration Magazine again. I can't tell you <laughs> how much we uh, can uh, can reflect that sentiment there. Um, Kim wants to go to dinner with friends again. She's looking forward to concerts and being able to travel again. Um, to travel near and far. Um, Travel, lots of travel, visiting, family, friends, museums, the beach and traveling, um, singing at church and going to dinner with friends afterwards. Um, let's see. Oh, Jan Reynolds is going to go to the Mesquite Symphony on the 20th for the first time Yay. since this all started. Um, Linda said visiting her grandkids who were five. Um seeing friends, um, seeing relatives in Florida, visiting Disney World, miss volunteering, um, mm. traveling, dancing um, with residents um, in their group gathering room with Marty Ruiz. Um, oh, why that, man, isn't that the truth? Seeing a smile when you're out, I'm the, I'm the goofy kid that's still always smiling. And then I go, oh, I can't see it anyway. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, going to granddaughter's college graduation in May Yay! in Kentucky. So uh, lots of great stuff. You know, it's, it is amazing, Dr. Daniels, how 
you know, through all of this, I think it definitely just from those answers has really given us all um, a sense of appreciation for the little things in our lives that we took for granted before, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, um, me and one of my best friends, we were talking and um, he's getting his vaccine. I'm getting mine. Our families are getting theirs. And, and uh, we were so just beyond excited to see each other and hug and sit out on a patio and have a drink because I mean it's been a year and a half since mm -hmm. I last saw him you know so it's um anyway um yeah uh let's see looking forward to traveling until um having dinner with their kids in their house um Oh, they used to eat together every week and haven't been able to do that. Um, uh, getting out for various events. Um, uh, Barbara and Tim said, hey, all I want to tell you all how much I will miss you all. Um, she's going to have a knee replacement. Good luck. Um, yeah, um, but she's going to have this done so she can go to her grandson's graduation in June and she's excited to travel It'll again. It'll be worth it. Uh-huh. And uh Lily Lee said thank you. Lily said thank you for a wonderful presentation. And Helen said great presentation. Um before I tell everyone they could unmute, not yet. Did you have anything in closing that you wanted to say, Dr. Daniels? Just thank you so much. I'd love to teach you guys again. This was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. I like the discussion. Guys, feel free to take yourselves off mute. Make some noise for Dr. Daniel. She did an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.